Hi, I'm Lori Long. I'm the chair of the Department of Management and Entrepreneurship. And on the behalf of our department, the School of Business, and Baldwin-Wallace University, I'd like to welcome you to the 2018 Charles E. Spar Chair in Managerial and Corporate Ethics Lecture. I'd like to thank Dr. David Kruger, our, our Spar Endowed Chair in Ethics, for organizing tonight. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kruger, who will introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And I want to echo that uh, welcome. Uh, if some of you are on this campus for the first time, welcome. And I hope you'll find reasons to come back. This lecture series um, is years old, and most years will deal with um, issues and topics in business ethics, but not always. It seemed to me this would be a good year to mix it up a bit and focus on the public sector and government. Uh, a lot of our students maybe know more about business ethics than government ethics, you know? What is it? What are its norms and values? Who manages those government ethics? What happens if there are uh, lapses in ethics? Are there any consequences? Well, I think there's probably no better person on the planet, I'm going to make that generalization, <laughs> to reflect on these issues than Walter Schaub. Walter, this government ethics, especially federal government ethics, is really, it's your life work, and I would say perhaps your vocation. So um, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Schaub, uh, undergraduate degree from James Madison University, his uh, JD from the American University. He has done some private practice, but virtually all of his career has been in the federal government in um, ethics-related positions, most prominently and most recently the U.S. Office of Government Ethics, which is the federal government's top ethics watchdog. Um, he has served there under a number of presidential administrations. He's been an attorney, a supervising attorney, deputy general counsel, and in 2013, he was named their director. And that is a nonpartisan, non-political, um, five-year appointment that requires Senate confirmation. Well, he resigned a year early last year in that term to become director of ethics at the nonprofit, nonpartisan campaign legal center in DC. He's a uh, regular CNN contributor, and if you follow these um, ethics issues on a weekly or daily or hourly basis, <laughs> um, it's more likely than not that you'll see his name listed as the ethics expert um, with whom they would like an opinion. Um, after his presentation, um, Professor Tom Sutton will come up and join us. Tom is uh, in our political science department, and he may be as well known off campus as on campus. Uh, you'll see him on Channel 5 News uh, the night of a, um, an election. And my morning is always made better when I'm driving to school with my NPR radio station on and I hear his voice and I perk up and I smile and I listen because he is a clear, concise um, analyst on all sorts of political issues. So he's gonna come up afterward, start the conversation, prime the pump just a little bit. If you know Tom from the radio, you know he's concise and he appreciates the issues and not hearing his own voice, right? <laughs> um, so he's gonna prime the pump, ask a few questions of Mr. Schaub, and then we're gonna have plenty of time, I think, for open Q&A with all of you. The title of Mr. Schaub's address tonight is, Does a Flourishing Democracy Need Strong Government Ethics? 
Walter, everybody in the house is hoping and praying you're going to say yes. <laughs> so will you join me in welcoming Walter Schaub? Well, thanks, everybody. David wasn't kidding about the news um, unfolding by the hour. I'm glad I checked my phone before I started because I had to change one line in this speech um, <laughs> because things are unfolding so fast. I'm really excited to be here at Baldwin Wallace University today, and I love that you're having an event focused on ethics. The idea of an annual lecture on ethics, trying to raise awareness of the issues, really appeals to me, and I hope I do it justice today because it's important for schools to focus on ethics and communities in general. Ethics is universally important, whether you're talking about business or government, the nonprofit sector or academia, it's hard to overstate just how important it is to every kind of human endeavor. And just how important it is can become clear when things start to go awry. That's where I found myself a little more than a year ago when I had to give a speech at the Brookings Institution on the day that the president announced his plan for what he was gonna do about conflicts of interest. It was the most difficult speech I ever had to give and I certainly didn't want to have to give it. I knew I'd probably pay a price either in terms of losing my job or worse, but I felt I had absolutely no choice but to sound the alarm because I had been witness to an unfolding ethics crisis that frankly has only gotten worse since that time. I began that speech by pointing out that you don't hear about ethics when things are going well. And that's certainly been my experience over a career focused on government ethics. When things are running well, there really are no newsworthy events. And that calm can lead people to forget about the importance of ethics. It becomes sort of an afterthought, as though it's an enhancement to a program instead of a core function. And it's not that most people don't care about ethics, I think. I, I suspect they just get caught up in the details of their substantive work. If you're in business, that means trying to enhance the bottom line or make profits. And if you're in government, that can mean pursuing the agency's mission. For instance, an NIH scientist might be ardently focused on creating a new cure to a chronic disease, or a VA manager may be focused on trying to figure out how to reduce wait times for veterans, and so they get caught up in that work. But the truth is that ethics is really at the heart of that work, and if you ignore it, you're gonna learn that the hard way as your problems start to mount. A failure of ethics can get in the way of the thing you're trying to achieve, or it can produce offsetting consequences that diminish the value of the thing that you've achieved. And worse, it could fundamentally change the nature of the thing that you have accomplished. That's particularly true in government, that last one about changing the nature of a thing, because in a free society, ethics is really inextric inextricably intertwined with public service. One thing that distinguishes democracies from authoritarian governments is the notion that governments serve the people. We're citizens, not subjects, and we have leaders, not rulers. Our leaders work for us because we entrust them with authority to pursue governmental policies on our behalf. And we expect them to use that authority solely for the benefit of the public and not to benefit themselves personally. That's why one definition of corruption that has gained currency in the international community is the idea that corruption is the abuse of entrusted authority for personal gain. Corruption undercuts the very concept of government in a representative democracy. Government leaders aren't representing us at all if they're advancing their own financial interests. And if they're not representing us, democracy is most definitely not flourishing. So the question of ethics, therefore, goes directly to the legitimacy of government. And it's imperative, therefore, to have a strong government ethics program. Government leaders shouldn't profit from their public service except for the salary we choose to give them. And there shouldn't be perks for attaining high office. 
Conflicts of interest shouldn't influence their decisions. Our leaders in the federal government are in Washington for only one reason, and that's to serve us. Or at least that should be the reason. Because the core principle of public service is that public service is a public trust, and we need to make sure that we have mechanisms to ensure that when we give our leaders power, they don't misuse it for their own benefit. So when I talk about mechanisms for ethics, what, what is that? Well, I'm talking about institutions of our representative form of government, the, the safeguards themselves. Now, what I'm not talking about is the policies that government officials pursue. There are plenty of policies, admittedly, that implicate issues of fairness or even morality or in the broadest sense of the word, ethics. But we debate those in the political realm, and I really view those as distinct from the topics of government ethics. The reality is, as has been said before, elections have consequences. And so who gets put into power will affect issues like guns and immigration and climate change and safety regulations. We expect those policies to change from one presidential administration to the other. But what's not supposed to change are the safeguards in place to prevent the abuse of entrusted authority for personal gain. And I think of it sort of as, as an analogy, I think of it as a container. It's the structures that hold together government and contains the, and has safeguards woven into it. The policies that they pursue on any of those topics I mentioned get poured in but they're fluid and you can dump them out when a new administration comes in and pour in that administration's policies. That's what elections are for. But it's the container that holds them that has to have structural integrity or we have real problems. And so government ethics is part of that container. We look at conflicts of interest and business relationships and family relationships and the topic of nepotism, gifts from outside sources, or using your government position that we've entrusted to you to help uh, a political ally get elected, or whistleblower retaliation, or the loss of impartiality, or the misuse of government resources, or any other misuse of your position or authority. So that's the kinds of things the ethics program looks at. A related issue that's also part of this container is the idea of free speech. When I worked for the Office of Government Ethics, both as its director and as a staffer, over the years we would get tons and tons of delegations from foreign countries that would come to study our ethics program and learn about how we were doing things. And we'd give them presentations and I would always start out by saying, you really can't have any kind of government ethics program if you don't have free speech. Ultimately, any ethics program depends on the people being able to speak out and agitate for change when there are abuses of entrusted authority. There are other parts of the container, too. Um, one of them is the electoral system, which involves issues like campaign finance and voter rights or redistricting, the accuracy of voter vote tallies when you're counting them up, or hacking and foreign interference. The group that I work for now is a nonprofit called the Campaign Legal Center. And you can check us out at campaignlegalcenter.org. Our organization focuses a lot, in addition to the ethics issues, on electoral systems. And as an example, last October, one of our attorneys argued a case before the Supreme Court trying to get them to say extreme partisan gerrymandering is not permitted. Gerrymandering, of course, is when you redraw the congressional district to make sure that the, the votes come out the way you want. It really amounts to the politicians picking their voters rather than voters picking which politicians are going to lead us. And so we think that's bad and we've been challenging it. Just today the Supreme Court heard a second case, this one coming out of Maryland, on the same topic. So. I think we're due for a decision, and I'm really hoping that they'll come down in our favor and, and ban that. There's two more parts of the container I'll mention briefly. One has to do with the independence of the law enforcement apparatus of the state. And to talk about that, I'll, I'll tell you about a time back in the early 2000s when the United States has these delegations coming to visit us, but they're also part of international agreements on anti-corruption. 
And as part of those agreements, teams of delegates from different countries come together and they'll review a country's anti-corruption mechanisms and make some recommendations for strengthening it. In the early 2000s, the team told us when they were reviewing the United States that they were concerned about the independence of prosecutors. They were concerned that they wouldn't withstand political pressure, that they didn't have enough independence. And so you could have a president, for instance, advocating for the prosecution of his political rival or asking the prosecutor or investigators to back off of an investigation. At the time, we just thought that didn't make a lot of sense. It seemed to us inconceivable that in the post-Watergate era, after America had learned its lesson, that a president could ever do anything like that. And so we weren't all that concerned. But now we have a president who has actually called for the investigation of his political rival. And he asked the main investigative agency in the federal government to back off of an investigation of his national security advisor. And when that didn't happen, he fired the head of that investigative office, the FBI, and went on national television and said he did it because he didn't like being investigated. So it turns out that recommendation from the international team was prescient and they, they knew something. Um, another element of the container is the merit systems principles. And if you don't work for the federal government, you may not know what they are, but it's a statute that lays out a number of principles for hiring employees. And one of them is that the main one, the focus, is to make sure that the vast majority of the federal government is hired based on merit rather than political affiliation. There's about 2.7 million people in the civilian federal workforce, and only about 4,000 of them are political appointees. That's a change because in the 1800s, we had the spoils system where one side wins and they fire everybody and bring in their own people. But by changing that in, with an act, the Pendleton Act in the, 19, in the 1880s, uh, we moved towards having a professionalized civil service so that we could ensure that government services are delivered by officials who serve the American people as a whole instead of political patrons. And in that context, this very cynical term, deep state, that some of them are throwing around these days, uh, which is really just intended to inflame the base of voters for, for a particular candidate, is a direct assault on the container guarding the objectivity of government operations. Because what they call the deep state is a workforce of dedicated public servants who are hired based on merit rather than political affiliation and whose loyalty is to the Constitution, the laws, and the American people as opposed to an individual leader. Loyalty to leaders has no place in a democracy. That's for places like North Korea and Syria and Uzbekistan and Russia and Iran, not for the United States. Now, there are arguably other elements of the container, but I think this is sufficient to show you that what I'm talking about is the content-neutral structural elements of government safeguards, not policy issues. So let's dive deeper into the ethics program in the federal government with that background. Each branch of government, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, the executive branch, has its own supervising ethics office. I want to look specifically at the executive branch because it's the strictest and by far the, the largest. It's led by the Office of Government Ethics, which I headed up until July last year, and it has about 70 employees. And those 70 employees oversee an ethics program for, as I said, the 2.7 million federal employees and indirectly all of the uniformed services as well. Um, so that's a lot. But there are actually another 4,500 agency ethics officials scattered throughout the executive branch and embedded in the various agencies. OGE does not supervise them, uh, but OGE controls their work by issuing regulations that set requirements for them and monitoring whether they follow through on those by conducting audits to go out and take a look at their work and see if they've implemented proper procedures. And it issues interpretive guidance to help them understand the laws and the regulations and even provides them direct assistance when they're struggling with a thorny legal issue and need help understanding how to apply it. But what OGE does not do is enforcement. It's a prevention mechanism, not an enforcement mechanism. For that, we have inspectors general in all of the large agencies, and, and these inspector generals, or IGs, 
have 14,000 investigators and auditors working for them. And in addition, when somebody steps out of line and violates a rule, agency managers can fire them or take other disciplinary action. And if the rule in question happens to be a criminal law, the Department of Justice can prosecute them. So overall, this is a fairly robust prevention mechanism, and it worked pretty well for 40 years. Both parties were supportive of it ever since it was created in the late 1970s under the Ethics and Government Act, which was passed as a reaction to Watergate. Nothing in the Ethics and Government Act would have, prohib would have prevented Watergate from happening. In fact, what happened at Watergate was already illegal and people went to jail. But the American people had lost confidence in government and passing the Ethics and Government Act was a message that we're gonna focus on ethics. And they did, it worked. Even though OGE lacked enforcement authority, OGE could go to the White House whenever somebody stepped out of line and say, we need help getting them back in line. And the White House would get them in line pretty quickly. And that was true in, under administrations of presidents from both parties, because both parties were supportive of the program. And the presidents led by example as best they could. Now, it's true that they were not technically covered by the ethics laws or the conflict of interest statutes or the, the ethics regulations. But all of these past presidents since enactment of the Ethics and Government Act in this post-Watergate era knew that it would be wrong to hold themselves to a lower standard than the people who work for them. After all, the whole idea of ethics and government is to ensure that power is used for the benefit of the people, and nobody has more power than the president, so the president should be held to the highest standard. The Department of Justice, the Office of Government Ethics, and the presidents themselves articulated this understanding. They knew that the president's exemption from the conflict of interest laws was not a perk for high office. It was just that recusal was inconceivable. Recusal is the idea that if you have a conflict of interest, you have to stay out of a matter and they can assign somebody else. But we only have one president and we need that president to participate in everything. So staying out of things is not an option. Instead, what they did is they divested, meaning sold or gave away their conflicting financial interests. And that tradition held firm for 40 years. Then in 2017, our current president refused to live up to that honorable tradition. And worse, he set about vigorously trying to monetize the presidency. This gets us back to that issue of private gain. Right after the election, he doubled the membership fee at Mar-a-Lago, his resort down in Florida. And he's made frequent trips to that resort and other ones. Every one of those trips is an advertisement because the press corps has to go with him. There's that image of him on TV talking about what he called the beautiful chocolate cake they were serving at Mar-a-Lago as he was chucking bombs at another country. And he spent a fourth of his time so far, or almost a fourth, almost one in four days in office hanging out at his golf courses. These trips, these golf trips, have cost us potentially as much as $100 million because you have to take an enormous entourage and a security apparatus and the football, you know, the thing that has the nuclear codes and the secret service and all of the government officials who want to work with you. He also actively makes private endorsements. He tells you to go read the book of this guy or watch the TV show of that network. Or he says, go buy Eddie Bauer products because Eddie Bauer supported me in the election. The message being, you can buy advertising from the president if you support him in the election. And he famously wore a baseball cap when he was at a press conference talking about the hurricane devastation in a region, wearing a cap that he was selling online for $45. And he's illegally used the presidential seal in violation of a criminal statute by slapping it on mugs that he's selling, like cheap tchotchkes that you can buy. And he's bought little plaques with the presidential seal that he can put on the tees at his own private golf courses. And you've got businesses and charities and politicians and foreign governments trying to curry favor with him by booking events at his Washington Hotel and other properties, and the Washington Hotel is charging a presidential premium. They made a profit their first year even though a lot of their rooms were empty because they charged above market rates for people who want to buy access to the president. A lobbyist can quite literally 
pay Donald Trump $35 for an overpriced martini so that they can sidle up next to a White House appointee who's hanging out at the Trump International Hotel, which has become something of a notorious hangout for them. And this assault on the container, as I've been calling it, has taken other forms. I mentioned the assault on the Department of Justice, and there's the assault on the First Amendment, calling the media the enemy of the people. There's nothing more serious, though, than the conflicts of interest. Due to the limitations of the financial disclosure process, he isn't required to disclose whatever liabilities his businesses have, or who his partners are, or who he's doing business with. And so we have no transparency into who he may be leveraged to and who, who has control over him in the sense that they could say, we're gonna harm your business by pulling out of this deal or calling this loan. We have no information and he hasn't been forthcoming saying, well, I kept these things, but I'm gonna go the extra mile since I broke with the tradition and tell you what they are. To the contrary, he's withheld his tax returns, which every other candidate always disclosed. And on the first day of his administration, he introduced nepotism. There's a half century old law that prohibits nepotism, but on the first day of his administration, in fact, early in the day, he had the Department of Justice issue an opinion reversing its prior opinion that nepotism applied to the White House. And they'd issued that prior opinion on four different occasions telling other presidents you can't hire a family member. But he got them to reverse it, brought them in, and that's created a series of problems. One of the most significant problems is the conflicts of interest because as often happens with nepotism, and it's the whole reason we don't allow nepotism in the rest of the government, his son-in-law and daughter have gotten preferential treatment and have been allowed to keep assets that White House appointees don't tend to keep. And we're not talking publicly traded stocks like Starbucks or Microsoft. We're talking large-scale real estate projects that need constant infusions of large amounts of cash. You can't just go and take out a mortgage to build a billion-dollar skyscraper. So he has to go to non-traditional sources and try to get loans from big, big, big interests domestically and foreign, which means that we have a senior White House appointee in Jared Kushner who is potentially vulnerable to foreign influence. And our spies found out that at least four countries were actively debating ways to use those conflicting financial interests to manipulate him. So there are some very real concerns. There's also been news reports about a blockade outside Qatar, which is a major United States ally in the Middle East. And suddenly, we decide to support a blockade of them two weeks after the Kushner family reportedly was unable to get them to lend them money. Or there's the news stories with conflicting accounts of what he may or may not have told the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, but the allegation is that he told him the names of people uh, who were opposing him. And the Crown Prince, we know, we don't know whether Kushner actually did tell him, but we do know that the Crown Prince rounded them up and put them in a hotel room where they were tortured and one of them was tortured to death. So there are very serious concerns, not only foreign, but domestic. We had the president announce a new policy of offshore drilling and then gave a, an exemption to Florida where Mar-a-Lago is housed and said, well, local voices wanted an exception. So all of these other governors said, well, I'm local and I want an exception in my state too, but they haven't gotten it yet. And we had that famous meeting recently where Jared Kushner is meeting in the White House with lenders who his family are seeking massive loans from, and it raises eyebrows. Now, we don't know what was said, and maybe there wasn't any explicit, you give me the loans and I'll help you out here. I, I doubt that anybody was that dumb, but it sends a message to these lenders that this family member of ours is very important in your life because he met with you in the White House. They didn't send somebody else. And by the way, how's that loan processing going along? It doesn't have to be explicit. It creates the appearance and, and in fact, possibly the reality of pressure, whether anybody actually succumbs to that pressure or not, is almost irrelevant. We should have a government that's free of that kind of pressure. And so that gets to the issue. Can we draw a direct link between things like the alleged loan-seeking activity and the blockade of Qatar 
or, or other aspects of, of our concerns about foreign po or domestic policy? And the answer is no, we can't know because there's too little transparency, and even in the best of times, when governments are being as transparent as they know how to be, we're not in the room with them. We can't know what they were discussing, and the issues are complex. Lots of factors lead into a thing. So we don't know whether these personal financial interests actually were the deciding factor. But the thing is, we shouldn't have to ask, and we shouldn't have to wonder. The burden of proof is on the government officials. We've entrusted them with great power and it's not only their job to use that power on our behalf, but to show us that they're using it solely on our behalf. If there's a cloud of suspicion around their actions, it's their fault. We sh it's not our job to have to wonder or to uncover it and prove it. The whole idea of a conflicts of interest program is you eliminate the opportunity for the conflict of interest to influence decision making. And in that sense, then, even creating the appearance of impropriety is bad behavior itself. It delegitimizes government and sets a bad tone from the top. That bad tone, by the way, has already had a trickle-down effect. We've got cabinet officials. I, I jokingly call them the champagne cabinet, but I, I say that as gallows humor because it's really actually quite depressing to see Scott Pruitt and Tom Price and. Steve Mnuchin flying around on charter jets, and Ben Carson paying $31,000 for a dining room table for his office, or Ryan Zinke paying $12,000 for a charter plane when he could have flown for $300 on a commercial flight. In fact, Zinke let a political party charge people more at a fundraiser to take pictures with the Secretary of Interior. That's not supposed to happen. Your, your access to a government official is not supposed to be for sale. There's also the Hatch Act, which is a law that prohibits the use of governmental authority for political activity. And we've, we've now had the agency that, that investigates Hatch Act violations ha issue at least three findings that Dan Scavino, the White House social media director, Nikki Haley, our UN representative, and Kellyanne Conway, special counselor to the president, violated the Hatch Act. And there are complaints pending against Jared Kushner, Ryan Zinke, and others. I was going to tell you that David Shulkin, the VA secretary, was hanging on to his job by a threat. But as I said, the news comes at us out of a fire hose these days. And I'm glad I checked my phone before standing up here, because he's gone now. And why is he gone? Because he chose to take a $120,000 10-day trip to Europe with his wife, where he arguably spent as much time sightseeing as doing business. And while there, took free tickets to Wimbledon, which are impossible to get, especially at the last second, and came back and told the ethics official it was OK because the woman who gave them the tickets is a friend of his wife's. But when investigators went and asked the woman, she couldn't remember his wife's name. So what we've learned in this first year of this administration is that there are significant issues with the ethics program. Some of it's institutional. For instance, there's no inspector general in small agencies or in the White House. So there's nobody to do the investigations. And agency managers can take disciplinary action for violations committed by their employees, but they have to want to. And if they don't want to, the Office of Government Ethics can write to the president. But what if the president doesn't care? And we know that he doesn't care because Kellyanne Conway has been found guilty of three different ethics violations by two different federal agencies. I don't mean they both found three, a total of three by two different federal agencies. And the White House has taken no action whatsoever. So what that tells us is that you can have laws on the books, but they're nothing more than words on a page if nobody's going to enforce them. That's relevant because there's a growing cry in the public to turn our ethical norms into laws. I question, however, how effective that would actually be if no one's going to enforce them. When the White House refuses to enforce the ethics law and Congress ignores that refusal, there's a limit to what laws are going to do. So I've actually come full circle across my career, and I was drifting in that direction before this administration, but it has really sealed it. I used to think that only laws mattered and that ethical norms didn't really have any impact. Stated differently, you can describe laws versus norms as rules versus values or rules versus principles. 
Now, with rules, the best you can hope for is bare minimum legal compliance. The rules set the floor. And if you don't violate the rules, you can say, I'm not a rule violator. Or if it's a criminal law, you can say, I'm not a criminal. But we ought to be able to do better than leaders who can only say, well, I'm not a criminal, at least. And that's the best we can do with rules. In reality, the rules aren't even being enforced. Think about this. We wouldn't be talking about needing new laws if we had a president who was enforcing them or a Congress who was having, holding hearings to find out why he won't enforce them. Does that mean I think rules have no place? Absolutely not. In fact, I made 13 different proposals for legislative changes that Congress could institute to strengthen the ethics program just last fall, and I met with the Republican and Democratic heads of that committee that oversees OGE, and they were gracious enough to listen to it and ask some really good questions. So I think there's always room for improvement. Although, to be fair, I would have made some of those proposals even before this administration. Only when you're in government, you have to get permission to make legislative proposals, and so I had to make them after I left government. But again, the laws are only going to do so much, and what we really need is leaders who will enforce the existing laws, who will embrace government ethics, and who will subscribe to a set of ethical principles. That's what you often call values-based ethics. Now, one criticism of values-based ethics is it raises the question, whose values? You guys over there might think you're being ethical if you do one thing, and you guys might think you're being ethical if you do the, the same thing a little bit differently. And so the question is, how do we resolve who's right? Well, the truth is, there is a way to at least lessen that confusion, because the government can articulate the values that are relevant to federal employment. And in fact, they already have. President George H.W. Bush, back in the 80s, issued a list of 14 principles that are the ethical principles that are supposed to guide federal service. And they're still on the books to this day. In fact, they've been incorporated into OGE's regulations and are relied upon all the time. To give you a sense of what I'm talking about, here's a few highlights. Don't use public office for private gain. Don't hold conflicting assets or conflicting financial interests. Act impartially and don't give preferential treatment. Conserve federal funds and property. Disclose waste, fraud, and abuse, and corruption. Those are pretty clear principles. But one problem with values-based ethics, and, and with these principles, in, in fact, is you could argue that they're subjective. And so how do, how do we know how to enforce them? Well, I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a speed limit that's 55 miles an hour. That's a rule. It's very clear. You know if you're going 55 miles an hour or 54, you're fine. You're in compliance. And if we, in contrast, have a principle that says drive safely, well, the concern is maybe you'll get pulled over by a police officer and you'll find yourselves arguing about whether you are being safe. So in that context, it sounds like rules are better. But what if we're in the midst of the worst ice storm in 100 years and cars are flying off the road right and left? I don't think anybody would doubt that driving 55 miles an hour, although legal, would be completely inappropriate in that context. So, so how do you enforce them? Well, we actually do enforce them in the federal government. Federal career employees have an appeal right if they get fired. They get to go before a board called the Merit Systems Protection Board and challenge their firing. And the government has to show that it was appropriate to fire somebody. And in fact, the government bears the burden of proof. But in my hypothetical, if you're a postal carrier, a letter carrier, driving around in a postal truck at 55 miles an hour in the worst ice storm in the past 100 years, you're not going to keep your job if you go in there and say, well, the speed limit was 55 and I was in compliance, so you can't do anything. In reality, the board is going to uphold your firing by finding that you didn't drive safely. So we're already living under a system where the federal government doesn't have to charge its employees with a violation of a regulation. It can say you did something wrong, like drove, drove on safely. And there was one time when one of these federal de foreign delegations that came to visit us at the Office of Government Ethics came from a country that was known to have a really strict ethics program. They were firing people right and left and, and doing even worse things like civil penalties. And they were stunned when we did our presentation and they saw the pages after pages after pages of regulatory texts with hyper-technical rules and exceptions 
because what they had was a list of principles, like the principles that George H.W. Bush included in our, our, his executive order and are our, our, in our system now. And they didn't supplement them with rules. Now, in some ways, a concern about values-based ethics is that they're fluffy and you could never enforce them. But actually, in that country, the interpretation of any vague uncertainty in the principle, how, how does it apply to this case? Was I driving safely? Uh, the policeman thinks I wasn't, and I think I was. Well, in that country, their ethics program errs on the side of giving the government the benefit of the doubt. If the government's saying the employee's driving unsafely, the employee's fired. There's no quibbling. So in that sense, actually, their bare bones principle statement is far stricter than our hyper-technical legal rule-based system. And the reality in both of those is that whether it's a rule-based system or a values-based system, it really comes down to tradition or practice. And, and if it's not carried out, it's gonna fall apart in either of those systems. So when we step back and look at how that's playing out right now, the ethics program is actually holding for now at the career level. They're still following the rules. But the bad tone from the top has trickled down to the political appointees as we're seeing daily in the news. And it's only a matter of time until it trickles down further. The program can only survive being under this onslaught for so long before it starts leaking out and, and now affecting the career, not just the political appointees. So we have to get our leaders to care about ethics again. That's a pretty gloomy prognosis, I'll admit, and it begs the question, so what's to be done? It's up to us to make them care. We have to pressure Congress and the White House to prioritize ethics, and it's gotta be a credible threat. What they respond to is the risk of losing. Now, I'm not naive enough in this hyper-polarized society of ours to think people are gonna change political parties over conflict of interest concerns. Back in 2016, when you had Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump arguing on the stage, if somebody had brought up conflicts of interest and made that a major focus of an entire debate, nobody's switching sides and voting for the other person. As a result, we have to push it back earlier in the process. What if somebody asked Donald Trump about his plans or his conflicts of interest when he was standing on stage with Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and John Kasich and Chris Christie and Ben Carson and Jeb Bush and all the others who were running? At one point, it was a gigantic crowd. If he had said, I'm not going to do anything because the president can't have conflicts of interest. I'm going to keep my assets. I'm going to make no effort to to mitigate the conflicts of interest. In fact, I'm gonna spend a fourth of my time hanging out at my golf courses and putting the presidential seal on mugs that I'm gonna to sell to you suckers. I don't think that would have gone very well because Ted Cruz and John Kasich, Chris Christie would have pounded him in that debate. And people could have cared because it wouldn't have required them to change political parties. And in fact, Donald Trump might have cared to come back at the next debate saying, you know what, I'm gonna divest everything. And then they might have gotten into a bidding war for the public's vote. Or he might not have done that, and that party might have nominated a different candidate. Well, you know, that's what happened in 2016. We didn't do that. We have to do that now, in this coming up election. There are already people whose names are being thrown out, and some of them are really wealthy individuals, like Mitt Romney and Oprah Winfrey and Tom Steyer, Mark Cuban, and other individuals. If any of them crosses that line and says, I am gonna throw my hat in the ring, the media and the public need to be asking them right from the start whether they're going to divest their financial interests and whether they're gonna make ethics a key focus of their public discourse, a key focus of their administration. It has to be a focus of our public discourse. What the next president does is gonna set the new tradition. If they say, well, Donald Trump didn't divest, so I don't have to, that's our new norm. There, you've reinstated a norm, but it's a really bad one. And so putting it earlier in the process, internal to a party, means that ethics can be focused on as a nonpartisan issue. I'll tell you, I had great experiences under both the Bush and Obama administrations. Whatever you think of either of them and their policies, they both and their White Houses were very supportive of the Office of Government Ethics and the ethics program it administered. Both parties have always, until now, been very supportive of the ethics program. 
So I'm hoping this is an aberration with just one individual and not a difference of parties. And in that context, I'll close by challenging you to demand ethics in government. This Congress isn't going to change the laws because they could wind up embarrassing the president. And even if they did, it wouldn't really get at the heart of things anyways, as I've said. What we need to do is reinstate the ethical norms. And that's only going to happen if the voters get involved and make it clear that ethics is a priority. The cavalry is not coming to save us from this ethics crisis. This is a do-it-yourself project to protect the principles of democracy. So we have to be vocal about government ethics. And so whichever party, whichever political party you support, start demanding that your party chooses candidates who are committed to government ethics and are willing to resolve their conflicts of interest. So that's my challenge for you today, and, and I thank you for hearing me out, and we're gonna have a session where we, we ask some questions. So thanks a lot. Wow, all right. That was a lot, wasn't it? Um, we are, by the way, videotaping this, and uh, Mr. Schaub has given us permission not only to use this internally for instructional purposes, but externally. So um, at some point, this will um, probably get on YouTube, um, hopefully fairly soon. And if you need to watch all of this a second time to reabsorb, um, you'll have that opportunity. All right. So um, assuming both of your mics are on, um, I'm going to ask Tom to uh, just throw out a question or two. Um, these two individuals will have a little bit of conversation, and then I'm going to be ready to receive questions from the floor. OK? All right, so we're going to find out if the mic is on. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. So Mr. Shao, uh, so much to work with. But I'd like to start with where you concluded, looking at the ultimate power, which is the power of the people to choose those elected officials. And we are uh, relearning and being reminded of why the framers made elections occur every two years, not four or six, which some occasionally prefer. <coughs> when I think back on major instances that pit Congress against the presidency, you mentioned Watergate, there was the Iran-Contra scandal under the Reagan administration, and there was the Paula Jones, Monica Lewinsky situation under the Clinton administration. The common denominator in each of these was that the party controlling the House was separate, different, it was the opposite party from the party of the president. So given that circumstance, do you see any chance that Congress could be proactive about what you're describing? A, should the Democrats win the majority in the House in November, or B, should the Republicans maintain their majority? Well, I think they're going to do what you guys have to do as a people. And so if the condition for being reelected is that you've got to be more active and you have been exercising congressional oversight, then maybe they will. But absent that, we haven't seen it so far. I don't have any reason to believe it will change. Uh, in fact, as you say, it was always kind of two different parties in Congress. And it doesn't have to be the whole Congress. I mean, obviously, the House is the only one that can impeach. At least initially, that it goes to the Senate. But they have to initiate it. But if you have a House or a Senate that is a different party than the White House, they can hold hearings. They can conduct investigations, and there can be at least some serious consequences. Um, I, I'm not interested in advocating for either of the parties. That's not my mission. I will say I'm going to be skeptical. Any time ever again we have the same party in both chambers of Congress and the White House, because those checks and balances we learned about as kids in civics classes depended on there being a will to actually conduct oversight. And I have been stunned by the passivity of this Congress. Uh, I've worked with, with, with some of them in my capacity as director of the Office of Government Ethics, and they always seemed pretty vigorous to me when they were a different party than the, than the White House. Some of them convinced me that they actually really do care about government, I mean, about government in general. Um, and so I would have thought some of that over 
oversight would have carried over even when the same party is in the White House as in both chambers of Congress. We haven't seen that. To be fair, we have seen some members of hope. You have Chairman Trey Dowdy, who's the Republican Chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, saying that he thinks it would be terrible if Mueller got fired. Or you have Chuck Grassley demanding that the White House um, release ethics waivers. They, in, in August, he followed up on an earlier demand and sent a letter, a bipartisan letter, two other senators who were Democrats, and he's a Republican, uh, demanding that the White House, even after I left, continue posting its waivers of ethics rules on its website. So we've seen individual winners, but we haven't seen anybody, for instance, stand up and say uh, proactively, you're not going to fire a mother or passing a law that protects him or, or something like that. So I have to say, I am pessimistic that we will see any oversight coming from Congress um, if the members of Congress don't fear that continuing to hold their seats is contingent on being more proactive in conducting oversight. And so I, I think it comes back to the voters. I'm not sure that you even have to have a change of parties if the same party comes in or comes in with some kind of new belief that, gee, that was awfully close, or gee, our voters voted for us to signal they won't do it again if we don't conduct voters. So a bit of a follow-up. Um, another part of those three scenarios that is different now is that we had put in place after Watergate the special prosecutor law that protected a prosecutor from being fired by the president. Right. And then by the time we got through with the Lewinsky scandal, that law was allowed to lapse, partly because there were accusations, often by the Democratic Party at that time, that Ken Starr went too far, that the investigation went too far, and now we have Mueller who does not have that protection. Do you see reinstituting that kind of rule, law, as something that would help move this forward? I don't know how I feel about that. You know, at the end of his investigation in the following years, Ken Starr himself recommended that they allow that law to last. So even he had concerns about whether it was the appropriate thing. It could, if we go too far, create the opposite situation where instead of a situation where you have the same party in both chambers of Congress and in the White House, you have a different party. What if they start invoking the Independent Council Act at the drop of a hat and use it as a political weapon when there's actually no suspicion whatsoever of anything? Um, so it's, it's a tricky balancing act, and I'm not sure, again, that I'm all that confident in specific laws doing that without the political will to, to enforce them or to use them uh, with restraint. Um, one nice thing if Mueller does not get fired is that as an employee of the Department of Justice, unlike the independent counsels like Ken Starr, is that he's subject to the Department of Justice's policies that require restraint in certain areas and, and prevent certain types of overreach. Um, and whatever you think about President Trump, I like the idea of some kind of internal fairness checks to make sure that there are limits. And Mueller is currently subject to those. A special counsel would not be. And so while I'm very concerned about Mueller being fired, I've worked with the Department of Justice enough to have respect for the safeguards that it puts on prosecutors to prevent abuses. And I worry that with an independent counsel, we wouldn't have those kind of safeguards. I would now like to open it up for questions from you. Um, a couple requests. Since we don't have mics out there, I'm going to um, ask you to really project your voice so we can all hear. I also want to request. You can restate it for sure. Time. Okay. Um, I also want to request that you make your question as short as possible. Okay. Um, so. Um, if folks can just begin to start raising your hand, and then I'm going to ask, we're going to start over here on my far left. If you could stand and try to project your voice, that would be great. Uh, thank you for your service and coming here tonight. Uh, the container, normally I would think, would benefit from strong free press. Uh, how do we view the press 
Uh, is Fox helping or hurting, I guess, is my question. What's the role of the press today? So, so the question was about the idea that the free press is valuable as a part of that container I described, but are there limits and can someone go too far? I mean, he gave, for instance, Fox News as an example. Um, I think of all the types of speech, political speeches, the most important, even when it's outrageous. Um, so I'm very reluctant to, to be enthusiastic about any kind of restraints on free speech, even in, in, in the context of concerns that we're having right now about you know, government actors pumping out false information over s social media. Um, I do think, for instance, in the context of social media, we should have the same kind of disclosure rules that we have for other forms of media. So you have to identify who's behind the political act. Um, we certainly do that in other areas, and it hasn't really curbed free speech. But if we start having some kind of truth commission that decides what is reality, uh, that can get very dark very quickly. And so I tend to err on the side of thinking that uh, we are in a new age where there's all these different platforms for, for drowning out legitimate information with, with frankly, garbage, uh, particularly when it's coming from Russian troll farms. Um, but I'm very leery of overacting by, overreacting by imposing limits uh, on the content of speech. Right here, the gentleman with the cap. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I recently returned from the Middle East and those dynamics of nepotism in government, particularly now after the Arab Spring, have kind of come to light um, as far as the ethics of those governments. Um, operationally, from a macro level, I love that international aspect of ethics that you brought in um, because it does get into that level of the U.S. the U.S. influence. A lot of those operational negotiations with um, some of our international partners. Operationally, when you yourself are kind of pioneering a policy that does not support an ethical approach to government, how does that operationally affect the nature of those relationships when the U.S. is attempting to convey its point of view on, let's say, one of those, uh, those states plagued by nepotism? Operationally, how does that operate? So that's a really good question. Uh, it was quite sophisticated, so I don't think I'll do it justice if I try to restate it word for word. I think the big question was, uh, what is the impact if we behave badly on our message externally? And the concrete example was given of us objecting to nepotism being an influence in certain other countries, and if we're doing it ourselves, how do we manage to have an impact? I think the answer is we don't. I think it's terrible that it degrades our, our influence. Uh, for years, as I said, we got all these foreign delegations, particularly from the developing world, that came to study our ethics program because it was viewed as the gold standard. That is not the case anymore. Uh, if they're not laughing at us, they're looking very sad and depressed about the loss of that leadership. Um, and so that's exactly the problem, is we lose our leverage in, and our moral authority, frankly, to be able to tell other countries, rise up to this level and, and improve the, the ethics in your country if we're not setting a model ourselves. And, and we've already seen some impact because we've seen um, in other areas like this, this constant cry from the president that the media is the enemy of the people, and everything is fake news. Uh, we have seen authoritarian leaders in other countries parroting his language because there's nobody left to criticize them if America is not going to take a leadership role. There was a really good um, op-ed in, I think it was USA Today today, by Tom Nichols, a, a conservative commentator, who was lamenting the loss of America's leadership role by this bad ethical behavior that we're seeing. I mean, we're now basically on par with the times in Italy when they had Berlusconi in charge. And nobody says, let's aspire to live up to Berlusconi. Uh, and nobody's saying, let's try to live up to what the US has right now. 
-hmm. Right here, yes, um, blue sweater. Take, take another question or two and then allow Tom to come back into the conversation with a question if he would like. Um, yes, sir, right here in the front. Tell us about the condition of the Office of Government Ethics these days. Who's in charge? Are there political appointees in the office? What's sure. the morale of the staff? Yes, so um, I left in July. My term was going to end at the very beginning of January. So I only had six months left, and would have been out anyway. So frankly, I, 
didn't have savings, so I would have had to get a job about a month or two earlier. Um, so you're looking at four months of me not being there that I would have been there. Um, and, and of course, I personally left because I thought I had reached the end of what effect I could have. And if I were to stay, I was afraid that I'd be legitimizing this uh, administration. And so for months, I weighed, am I having enough effect to offset what I'm legitimizing I was doing? Um, and there are a number of complex factors that we don't have time to discuss here or now that I've talked about publicly elsewhere. Um, but felt I needed to go. And at the time I left, the staff's morale was pretty good. They felt very strongly about their mission. They felt that they were taking a stand to be uh, supportive of government ethics. And as I said, the program is still holding at the career level. So for the vast majority of the 2.7 million federal career employees that they're working with, uh, they feel pretty good about how it's going. When it comes to Senate confirmed appointees, OGE has a lot of leverage because they can't go forward to a Senate confirm a Senate confirmation hearing until OGE signs off on their package saying that their nomination package saying they have entered into an ethics agreement that resolves all their conflicts of interest. And so for presidential appointees at the cabinet level and, and other Senate confirmed positions, we actually were doing really good work resolving their conflicts of interest. And in fact, we were moving them even faster than we had managed to move President Obama's appointees, even though they were far wealthier and due to the bad example set at the top, some of them were uncooperative, not all of them, but some. And yet we still managed to move them faster. And that kind of success made the staff feel like they were still making a difference in important areas of their work. Where things were falling apart had to do with White House appointees who we didn't have that kind of leverage over, and certain other uh, situations that we didn't have as much control over. And, and that was disheartening when they focused on the parts that, that they felt they were able to make a difference on. Um, the second in charge of the agency was the highest ranking career official named Shelley Finlayson. She was the acting director for a whopping two days before they replaced her uh, with my general counsel, who had, as it turns out, been working closely with them without me knowing it and had managed to appreciate himself uh, enough. And I've spoken out publicly about some of the things he did. If you're interested, I wrote an op-ed in the LA Times about this bizarre legal defense fund that he created that is in my view, the worst thing the Office of Government Ethics has done in its 40 years of existence. Um, and there was this recent letter that made news the past week about how supposedly the White House Counsel's Office is investigating Jerry Kushner. That rumor came from a letter that the acting director signed and sent to Congress to get Congress off his back and wrote, oh yes, the White House Counsel's Office is investigating this, we'll get back to you. He didn't use the word investigating, but he really built it up like working to ascertain the facts and evaluate whether a violation has occurred. And so all these news stories came out that there was an investigation, and I didn't believe it for a second. And to the White House's credit, the White House never claimed, as far as I can tell, that they were investigating Jared Kushner. And they came out and said, well, we're not investigating him. Uh, so the, the irony is the one time they were really honest about something, the Office of Government Ethics had dirty hands. Um, which is really disappointing. It's kind of heartbreaking to me to see it in that state. But they have nominated an individual, and I don't think we could have hoped for a better individual. This is a guy who's a long-term career, uh, career employee, not a political. So it's not like they're bringing back Steve Bannon or Corey Lewandowski, or who was that wife beater alleged, wife beater guy <laughs> on um, Yeah, they're not nominating any of these guys. They're nominating a career employee who had served in the Bush administration's White House. And as I said, he had been a political appointee in the Bush administration White House, but he had been a career guy before and after. And he's a man of good character uh, and honest, and he's going to be great at the job. I just hope they confirm him soon to get the acting director out of this guy in place instead. His name's Emory Rounds, and I vote for Emory. <laughs> okay. Tom, do you want to um, put a question on the table quickly? Well, I can't help but be political under these circumstances. And my own view is that when it comes to the voters, while ethics is a high standard and something we'd like to all say we support, 
When it comes right down to it, we tend to vote interests. We tend to vote what we see as our needs right in front of us. Ethics may be a part of this election, and certainly with some of the candidates, some of the issues, the Me Too movement, some of these other issues that intersect, I think, in some ways with what you're talking about. But let's say you are a die-hard Republican Trump supporter, and you see these things, they're troubling, but you don't want to see this president removed, and you don't want to see him impeded. Uh, what you just said about this uh, possible new, some new appointee to head the government ethics office, is that a sign of recognizing that at some point these ethics issues get in the way of fulfilling the agenda of your supporters? And even if it sounds cynical, that may be enough motivation for a White House or other agencies to start cleaning up their act. Well, that's a fair question. And I'll preface this by saying we can't know what's in their head. So that's certainly one possible scenario. Um, I don't think so because we're continuing to see ethics problems unfold and the speed of light. It feels like it's cutting at us through a fire hose and it's hard to keep up. I mean, as you saw today, you can't even write a speech uh, and show it to him for the facts here. Uh, so I think our problems are going to get worse instead of better. Uh, if I were to hazard a guess, and again, as I said, you can't know what's in your head, but if I were to hazard a guess as to why they nominate Henry Rounds, uh, two things that come to mind is maybe there are some people in Congress who remember him from the Bush administration and have pushed for him, and sometimes Congress can push the White House to do something. Or maybe all of this bad public attention has gotten to them, and they felt pretty beaten down, and they realized that there's a danger that if they nominate somebody really uh, far out, uh, that the blowback is going to be terrible. And what they'd like to do, perhaps, is go back to having kind of a quiet office of government ethics. And I don't think that anybody, including this nominee, is necessarily going to stand up to that. And so it might have been a good enough solution that, and, and they know me well enough to know, because we worked together for this month before. I they know me well enough to know that I'm going to come out praising their nomination of Henry Rounds. And uh, in fact, the entire new government group has praised that particular pick. Uh, and so I give them credit. They did the right thing. I don't want to go too far and think that means they're going to turn over a new leaf. But they did the right thing, and they deserve some credit for it on that occasion. And on the issue about changing parties, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, no Trump supporter is going to turn around tomorrow and vote for uh, the other party, um, particularly if they you know, want some hypothetical nominated the same person they did last time, which is not going to happen. So. Um, but, but you've got the two extremes, and you've got some people in the middle. And this election, was a strange one because for the second time in my life, the candidate who won the election didn't get to be the president. They got the most votes by far, didn't get to be the president. It's because we've got this weird quirky system that's hard to explain to other democracies why we do this. Um, I, I struggle with it. But what that means is the votes are actually quite close because if it's going to take all of a lot of states, most of the states, um, you may win by a little to get all of those electoral votes. And so there's people in the middle who might be persuaded one way or the other. Maybe, I don't know about the 2020 election, but what I do know is that in 2024, if this president wins again, he has to leave unless he you know, continues to careen towards the third period and so it's suspense. <laughs> the election's got to help us. But um, he has to leave, and then we've got to even playing field. Got two different parties, and that's the time when they can start making an ethics an issue. And even before then, the public can start making an ethics an issue in congressional elections. Uh, members of Congress are not held to the same high standards that the executive branch is. They focus more on disclosure rather than the best interest or other things. Uh, but you can certainly uh, make an issue out of to what extent are you going to hold the executive branch accountable. And after you look at that election in, in Pennsylvania, there may be a number of candidates from the same party who are from swing districts who are going to say, you know what, I'm going to hold the executive branch accountable no matter which president, you know, which party has the president. And so 
And no one is solid enough to think. Is the problem going to be solved by 2018 or 2020? I don't know, maybe not. But it can be solved by 2024 if we, if we start pushing out for ethics. And again, my focus is not getting one party or the other, and it's getting ethics back to being a priority. And I still think it's worth a try to put ethics front and center when you've got several different candidates from the same party standing on the stage. I'm going to entertain one last question out there. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about your experience with IG Horowitz. Is it consistent with his decisions and um, actions that he's taken in the Trump administration? Are they consistent with the man you worked with in previous administrations, or are they a little bit alarming and bewildering, like his decision to um, open an investigation to the age of Biden for um, application? Yeah. Um, the question was what do I think of the IG of the Department of Justice, Michael Horowitz? And, and you gave some examples of things that it's going to be that, that you found concerning. Um, what I can say is that I've got a high opinion of Michael Horowitz and think that he's very professional. And his peers say that because there's this entity called the Council of Inspectors General for Integrity and Efficiency. And Congress established it. It's actually sort of its own agency. It's got a handful of employees and, and a number of detailees. Um, and, and functioning as a board of that agency are all of the different inspectors general. And by statute, the director of the Office of Government Ethics was on that committee with the IGs. And so we'd have these monthly meetings where they'd all come together and debate different issues. And his peers elected him the head of that. Um, he was voted by just an open vote of inspectors general um, and was elected to lead that. So he clearly has the respect of his peers. I only had good experiences with him. He's got access to information that we don't have. Um, I'm inclined to give him the benefit of the doubt because I only think good things of him. And, um, and there's a lot we don't know that he has access to. So um, I can't explain different decisions, but I'm not privy to the information he is. And my inclination is um, to trust him. And you will find that inspectors general make people nervous because they do investigations and they come down and, and issue findings that are very uncomfortable for people on either side of the aisle uh, because in my experience they're driven by a passion to hold the government accountable and they really, in my experience, don't care what party somebody is. Um, again, I don't understand all of the decisions that are made, but I choose to believe that there's an explanation that I just don't have because I don't have all of the information. Um, and as with anybody, I can be proven wrong. I mean, they've made statues of people that then turn out to be bad, and you got to tear down the statue. So, um, but I don't have any reason to believe that's ever going to happen with my government. So I'm impressed with the guy and, and still have. If a lot happens between today and tomorrow, maybe we, we should hold you hostage and come back tomorrow night for part two, right, of an ongoing discussion. In all seriousness, to end tonight's um, session, we're going to give you a gift, Mr. Schaub. Here's the good news. He's no longer working for the federal government, so I don't need to worry about whether this violates his code of conduct that had been there because we would not have wanted to get you in trouble, of all people, right? Um, <clears throat> but we have a gift. Um, this is a, a, an original piece of art that one of our graduates uh, commissioned. I commissioned her to do. She does um, art that primarily focuses on nature. And I said, well, Emily, this guy was the chief ethics watchdog of the US government. Do you have a piece of art for him? Or can you do a piece of art? And she said, of course, but I'm going to need to think about that for a while. She did. Um, I'm going to 
let all of you see this piece of art, although you might need to come close to look at it um, um, after we're down off the stage. Um, but I want to read the inscription on the back because that will help us understand uh, this piece of art. Emily says, on behalf of Baldwin Wallace University, thank you for your unswerving commitment to government ethics and the principles necessary for good government. We admire your dedication to upholding ethical standards and voicing concerns about unethical conduct. This photo was taken at John Hines Wildlife, Wildlife Refuge, a wetland preserve in Philadelphia in a sea of development. It reminds me of the importance of being positive and sticking to your principles regardless of what is going on around you, and that while individual actions may seem small, uh, they make an impact and are noticeable to others. May you continue to inspire others to stand up for what they believe is right and in defense of the public interest. Best wishes, Emily Bryant um, Kilsen, class of 2010. So this is, um, you're not going to be able to see it, but come on up if you'd like to um, check it out. So there's a, a branch of a tree or something um, <laughs> with uh, kind of muted light in the background, but that really illuminates this single species. Oh, so um, we hope you'll find a place perhaps oh. in your home or office I absolutely for that. Do. I will be happy to do that. She can do the same herself. Yeah. Um, so thank you for coming, Tom. Thank you, Walter. Thank you so much. I hope this has uh, been enlightening and thought-provoking. And again, maybe we'll hold him hostage and come back tomorrow night to do part two. So thank you.